Hallelujah. The number of you have profited going through for your spiritual edification. The Bible says that he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life eternal. He that sows unto the flesh shall of the flesh reap death. And I want to salute those of you in the overflow standing outside and watching. I want you to know that the nations will celebrate you. Hallelujah. Thank you very, very much. Every time I come in and I see people hungry, open to receive, for me, I am so blessed. And I say, Lord, I pray that your word will come strong and bless you. Because I know that the word of God is changing us in this place. It's causing us to see him. Even so, come Yeshua, come. Even so, take your pride away. How my soul longs to see your face, my Lord. Even so. So, come Yeshua, come. The Spirit and the Bride. Just listen to me, I don't want you to sing it. I'm ministering to you. Even so, come Yeshua, come. Even so, come take your bride away. How my soul.
Let the love and the beauty of the Lord never cease in this place. Lord, I pray that you hide not your face from us. Because we be
Wow. Chairman, we have Koinonia Mass Choir. Hallelujah. Thank you. You know, little things like this have a way of just taking away every fear and anxiety. Do you know that? The Bible says a merry heart do it good like medicine. Sometimes we just become children in his presence and jump and sing. I know for some of you it's a bit embarrassing considering your status I apologize. But I realize that the greatest in the kingdom is the child. There is another Yes Lord Yes Lord Help us In the name of Jesus Alright very quickly Let's go to the word Lord we thank you Let your word come with power Let it come with grace Let it come to change our hearts In the name of Jesus I'm teaching on a very powerful subject very very powerful and critical um, the Bible makes us understand in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 10 down to 12 hallelujah that when Jesus resurrected he gave gifts unto men some apostles and prophets and teachers, evangelists and pastors, the Bible says for the edification, the building, the equipping, the preparation to make ready hallelujah those who will do the work of the ministry so that we will come into the fullness of the stature of the person of Christ and that we be firm so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine I'm going to be teaching a message I titled Firm Foundation we're going to be examining some powerful things today Firm Foundation very quickly Luke chapter 6 Luke chapter 6. Oh yes, there is no other. There is no other. There is no other. Truly there is no other. Luke 6. Verse. Verse 46. Luke 6, 46, very quickly. And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you whom he is like. 48. He is like a man who built a house, and dug deep, and laid the foundation. Take note. Laid the foundation on a rock, and when take note, not if, when, when a flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a, a man without a. So it's possible for a man to be without a foundation. Like a man without a foundation. What's the consequence? He built a house upon the earth. Against which the stream did beat vehemently. And immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Tonight the Lord is going to be helping us to examine the foundations on which our faith is built upon. Hallelujah. There are so many believers who we do not know what we believe in the kingdom. There are many believers who do not know what they stand for. Do not know what the kingdom is all about and what we stand for. That's the reason why people are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Hallelujah. We live in a time and a dispensation where anybody can cook up any doctrine in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And one of the things that the Lord is helping us to do is to let us, um, permit us to be grounded steadfast in the integrity of God's truth and His word. Hallelujah. So that when Satan comes to sway us from the truth, when he comes to make us 
look as if the word of God is a lie and that God is out to deceive us, the firmness and the quality of our foundation will keep us and will cause us to represent Him. There are so many believers without structural foundations. Hallelujah. That's why I like the good old orthodox circles. When they get people born again, they have what they call discipleship programs. Now I know that a lot of what people call discipleship today is just religious indoctrination. Where they bring people and teach people about men and the doctrines and the dogma of men. Hallelujah. How be it is important that when believers come into the kingdom, they are well grounded. Hallelujah. The quality of any foundation determines not just the longevity but the quality of that thing. Hallelujah. So very quickly we are going to be talking about firm foundation. The goal of this teaching tonight is to bring the body of Christ to a point where we understand the basis on which our faith, the basis on which our trust in God, the basis on which everything around our Christian life is hinged upon. For when we understand that, it will be impossible for Satan to sway us. There are so many believers that have given up in the midst on the face of certain challenges. That's because our foundations are formed. Many of us, our foundations are built on religion and not truth. Hallelujah. There are so many believers who have their foundations built upon the doctrines of men and the, the, the understandings of men. Many of us, our doctrines, our, our foundations are built upon denominationalism and uh, uh, traditions of men and legalism and all of these things. But it's important for us to re-examine our foundation that we be grounded. Hallelujah. Now very quickly, what is a foundation? We are teaching. Please, if you have something to write, write. I want to encourage you. Every time you come here, we are coming here to learn God's word. Hallelujah. So come with something to write. It's very, very important. Many of you just throw with pieces of papers in your pocket. Then you just bring it out and you see where you wrote your list for the market. Gas, stove, kerosene. You just draw a straight line. And then you are writing something that is supposed to change your destiny. Invest. There's, there's a preparation. When you go for a lecture, you go with your notebook. It tells you that you value what the lecturer is about to say. And that you realize its importance to equip you for the times of exams. Hallelujah. Don't feel bad if you didn't bring anything. There's love. Love covers everything. Hallelujah. So what's a foundation? Very quickly. The dictionary defines a foundation as the lowest load-bearing part of a building. The load-bearing part of a building. Typically below ground level. So a foundation is not on the zinc. Foundation is below ground level. The load-bearing part of a building is called its foundation. The load-bearing part. That part of the building that is responsible for taking all the weight. Another definition. A body or ground on which other parts rest or are overlaid. Hallelujah. That means when we pile books upon this substance, this becomes the foundation. The platform on which all other structures are laid and are lifted. So that's very, very important. That means the foundation of your faith in Christ is the platform on which every other revelation Every other understanding, every other pursuit will rest upon. That means when your foundation is faulty, believe me, no matter the quality of the building, it is liable to crash. Hallelujah. So many believers who do not understand the concept of foundation and the importance of understanding the things. What did Jesus teach? Hear me. What did Jesus teach when he came to the earth? What was his message? What did he leave with us? What was his um, mandate towards the church? These are the things, the pillars on which our Christian race will 
be founded upon. For many people, their foundation for the Christian journey is just success and money. So many believers whose foundation is money. They were lured into the kingdom as a bait to become prosperous. Hallelujah. Now there's a place for wealth and prosperity. It's part of the packages and the blessings of redemption. But that is not a foundation. Are you listening to me? It's not a foundation. This light is beautiful. It's illuminating the place. It's very important. The microphone is beautiful. But these are not the foundations of this building. Are you listening to me? So, that a, a doctrine or a teaching is not a foundational one does not mean it's not relevant. How be it when the, the Bible says if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Hallelujah. So it's important because there are many of us who have great revelations but they are resting without foundation. We know things about the realm of the spirit. We know things about angels. And then because many believers do not have correct foundations, we begin to dabble into elements of witchcraft, into metaphysics, Christian science, New Age theology, in our bid to understand the reality of the person of Christ. We begin to explore this, in quote, mystery called God. And many people land themselves into metaphysics. And Christian science and new age doctrines all in an attempt to understand God. Hallelujah. So it's important. But when you understand the basic foundation of who God is. Many of you who study physics and all of this, they teach what we call FI units. Hallelujah. And every other um, unit that will be derived is only a derivative of this thing. Is that correct? And so we must understand the tenets on which the Christian faith is built upon. The benefits of having a firm foundation is number one. It gives you a rock solid Christian life. Gives you a solid Christian life. That your Christian life is not based on religious doctrines of men, my church, your church, my pastor, your pastor, this is what I was taught, this is what I knew growing up. No. A firm foundation gives you a rock solid life. Number two is the antidote to wrong antichrist doctrines. The antidote to religion. The antidote to falsehood. When you have a firm foundation, you will have discernment enough to know that no matter how powerful a teaching, how many of you, okay, well, I, I don't want to ask that question. But I know that there are a number of people who were involved in all kinds of yoga, zodiac, new age things. And let me tell you, if you're looking for, in quote, revelation, go to the new age. You will see revelations that will astonish you. Hallelujah. Confucius came with his own rema. Buddha has his own. All kinds of people have their own rema. And they look logical in quotes. But when we have a firm foundation, it becomes an antidote to error. Let me show you something the Bible has to say. Turn with me very quickly to 1 John chapter 4. There's a caution that is so important, especially for our generation. 1 John chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. At least if you have your Bible, I'll appreciate it. You turn here. 1 John, if you don't have, just share with someone. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Is it in your Bible? Hallelujah. But test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. But so, by this, know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist of which ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is in the world. In America, in Nigeria, 
it's in Zaria, it's in Abuja, Abuja, it's in Port Harcourt, everywhere. And several believers, they truly love God, but because their foundation is not firm, many people have left the doctrines that Jesus left with the church. Many people have left the message that Jesus gave the church. Many people have derailed from the expectation that Jesus has for the church. And we are doing all kinds of things. Preaching different kinds of gospels. Being motivated by different kinds of things. And tonight the Lord is going to be helping us to examine our foundation. Say Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you Heavenly Father. Now, there are two things I'll be doing very briefly. Number one is to... We are going to be examining very briefly. I'm not here to create confusion and talk. But very briefly, we are going to be examining what has gone wrong with the church, especially with respect to several doctrines. There have been several doctrines, and then we will, we will end by looking at what I call the Christian's statement of faith. How many of you have gone to a website and then you see statement of faith? A summary. How many of you are or were in the Anglican? Let me see your hands. Hallelujah. When I was in the seminary, we had something we called the Apostles' Creed. How many of you still remember? I believe in God, creator of heaven and earth, his only begotten Son. Uh -huh. Some of you have forgotten. New creation has carried you. Hallelujah. And every single day, although we're doing it religiously, but little did we realize it was putting in us a summary of everything that Jesus is and that He represents the church. Very, very powerful. And tonight, we're going to be examining very quickly. Now, because of lack of firm foundation, We've had people use all kinds of bases to interpret different things in Scripture. Hallelujah. People have misinterpreted several things in Scripture. And as a result, has led to movements, has led to patterns, has led to doctrines and errors. And several believers are suffering. One of it is the issue of appearance. Hallelujah. As a result of this, there is a great controversy in the church as regards the concept of appearance. Now that means everything, dressing and all of that. A man should not wear what belongs to a woman. You know, and this and that. Women should veil or not veil their hair. Wear trousers or not wear trousers. Makeup or not make makeup. Jewelry or not jewelry. And although many believers want to press into God, this has become in many circles, for instance, the basis for many things. Choosing leaders, Determining whether people are growing or not. Hallelujah. And we cannot pretend that there is need for a voice to be raised and addressed. It. That's why the Bible says the foundation of the church was built upon the apostles and the prophets. And if the apostles and the prophets fail to bring the church to order, then we have failed as a gift of the church. Hallelujah. There are several people suffering in silence, not even knowing. Even those who claim to be walking in quote in the now new creation cannot even defend why they are doing what they are doing. For instance, those who wear veils cannot tell you why they are wearing veils. Those who say, okay, I've rebelled, now I'm not wearing veils. They cannot even tell you why they are not wearing veils. Those who wear trousers cannot tell you why they are wearing trousers. Those who don't wear cannot tell you why they are wearing. There's all kinds of confusion in the body. And the church is full of a bunch of arrogant and religious people who claim they understand many people who believe they are the Holy Spirit in the church. And all kinds of people have written devilish books born out of new age and the doctrines of men. And several ministries have used it as their patterns. And they have discipled many people, generations into error. Bible says, nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every man that name the name of Christ 
So, God has his own foundation. There are many ministries that have built their foundations. Many doctrines, many pastors, many church leaders, many apostles, many prophets have their doctrines. But the Bible says there is something called the foundation of the Lord. Nevertheless, in spite of all kinds of foundations we have, there are many believers, for instance, who have been made not to press into intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Every time you pray, you sense the presence of God. And every time you go and ask the elders, they tell you you are demonic. And these experiences have derailed us from koinonia, intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Because the people cannot understand what is happening, they call it wrong. That's what happened to the scribes and the Pharisees when Jesus came. They didn't understand the new move and the pattern that the Holy Spirit Several people have been misled and misguided. There are many people who believe that the apex of their spiritual experience should be the apex of the church's spiritual experience. So that when there is any spiritual experience that defies their own personal experience, they term it as error. And they write books to defend what they believe is their knowledge. But there is no man who is the custodian of wisdom except Christ himself. All of us are students in the school of the spirit. So instead of arguing and bringing stupid opinions and boldly writing books and making claims and misleading people, I cannot tell you how it pains me when I watch people walking in error and religion. There are many doctrines, there are many religious circles that do not believe, for instance, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are many religious circles, for instance, that do not even believe in the Trinity. Follow me. So the issue of appearance has been a big issue. Many of you have been, many of you, the way you are blessing God now, sitting on your seat, I say, God, thank you. Whatever devil stopped me from coming for Koinonia tonight. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's another issue that has been fought violently in the church. For others, they have embraced all of his ministry except that strange, controversial issue of tongues. Every other one is okay. For others, they have totally exited out. There are many circles that have taught today that the era of miracles are over. They believe it. It's in their books. They force you to to know it before they baptize you. If you came tonight to hear the truth, then you will hear it. And hear me friends, there are two categories of people in this place as I speak. Those who are open hearted to say, Lord, please walk on me. It doesn't matter what I have believed. If it is against your truth, my heart is open. And those who will shell themselves out of religion and begin to explain away the things that say all these kind of people. I've always known that these young people are very stupid. Now I have an opportunity to confront them. Ellie who said there is a spirit that is in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty is what maketh men of understanding. Hallelujah. And then the concept of sin and holiness. Hmm. We have certain people who believe that you walk your salvation with fear and trembling. And you've gone out of context to what the Bible says. And teaching people to live under religion and bondage. There are so many people trying to die for their sins. When Jesus has paid the price. On the other hand, we have other foundations who have taught people that because Jesus has died for do anything, sleep in the name of Jesus, Drink in the name of Jesus. Steal in the name of Jesus. Love in the name of Jesus. There's grace for you. Both of them are faulty foundations. There is a foundation called the foundation of the Lord. So we have many people drinking and smoking and come and climb the pool pit. There are many discipleship leaders who are the drunkards. There are many people who do all kinds of things. Ah. I hope this silence means you are receiving it. Uh, 
Hallelujah. Grace and works. Another issue. Very controversial issue in the church. Others believe we are in the dispensation of work. Work it out. Everyone will only help those who help themselves. Now there are people who believe that God is our father. And therefore cross your leg as a son and allow him to just ride you through destiny. Then we have the issue of salvation. Once saved, always saved. Or once saved, you can lose your salvation. Another controversial teaching. So who is right and who is wrong? I'm addressing an issue, I'm sorry to say it, and I say it with all humility, that many people are afraid of addressing on pulpit Because they are afraid of losing members. Afraid of, you must be dead to yourself to take this kind of serious. At the end of this meeting now, there are going to be different stories and opinions. Listen, friends, God didn't ask us to become philosophers. He just asked us to become obedient to His word as the Holy Spirit. We have complicated the reality of God's word. Let's look at a few others. The doctrine of the rapture. We have others who have taught. That there's nothing called rapture. No rapture. No Jesus. And, and, and truly, um, it's true that there's no word rapture in the Bible as it were. Okay, I've not, I've not stood in any side. See, I'm giving two sides. So I'm still neutral. So we have those who preach the doctrine of the rapture. That there is an event that is called the rapture. Others are saying there is an event. That is not called the rapture. Another thing. Then we talk about the pre-tribulation. The mid-tribulation. And the post-tribulation. I'm showing you different kinds of foundations that we have in this blessed kingdom of our Father. Others have taught that the church will be persecuted. And then, when we are persecuted and everything is over, Christ will come and take the church. That's what we call post-tribulation. Others are saying will be persecuted for a period of three and a half years. After that, in the midst of it, Christ will come and rapture the church. That's what they call mid tribulation. And then others say we are not going to face it. So who is right? Because every one of us belongs to one or two of these circles. And you have been asking questions. And then others say there's nothing like rapture. We're going to be on earth forever. Hallelujah. It's encapsulated in a popular doctrine called the doctrine of immortality. Then the concept of the Antichrist. Who really is the Antichrist? This Antichrist says, many of us cannot sleep. We have been punished because of certain tapes you made a mistake of buying in bookstores. And from that day till now, your mind is not bad because you had a faulty thing about the Antichrist. I remember one of my aunties, I shared the story very humorously. Uh, I think in 1990. 99 or 98 or something 99 minding my own business loving the Lord this woman called me to her room and showed me one book Latin book and they calculated everything and it showed that Pope John Paul the one that has died though that he is the Antichrist based on certain Roman numerals and it arrived to him hallelujah now she said look she's already rehearsing she stopped eating meat Stop taking milk. Now listen. We're, we're, we're examining foundations tonight. She stopped taking so, several things. And told me. I said why? She said she's preparing herself. Nobody knows tomorrow. Ah. And so she was incorporating into the fellowship. Out of love and sincerity. It makes sense to me. No meat. No milk. Ah. What else will you eat? So who is the Antichrist? There are several teachings. You know why I'm saying this? Because many of us seated here were taught one or more of these things. And how many of us fully desire to grow spiritually? How many of us are ready to check our foundation and once and for all build upon something that is true of God? 
That's what I told myself years ago. I began to say, Lord, examine my condition. And I found out that my life was built upon salty things. The concept of prosperity and poverty, another foundation. There are many people that preach that prosperity is the way forward. I mean, if you are not prosperous, forget it. It's an insult to redemption. There are others who have preached that if you are poor, that's the way forward. God likes it. It's a nice life. You live a quiet life. You are not open to immorality. You are not open to pride. It's very nice. In a simple one bedroom, you and your wife and then one or two children. Why? Having five children is even a prosperity. You have two or three. According to a moderate and a contract life. There are several other documents. Should women preach in church? Should they be allowed to preach in church? God has said, forget it. Every woman preaching in church is going to hellfire. Because the Bible says it. Now others have said it's true. This is where what is the truth? Have you not how many of us have been asking this question secretly? Confess now. How many of you you just don't want to say it so that it doesn't become you say it's not with my mouth, you hear it. However, these are our contemplations in the secret place. And somehow we know that in the answers we will receive light in the next dimension of our understanding and knowledge of Christ. Like I said tonight, my job is not to create controversy. This is a long teaching and um, I'm not here to begin to examine certain things, but there are three of this that I want to address. Three of it. Hallelujah. Many of you think I'm going to talk about appearance. I will not talk about appearance. So if you are... One, let me tell you, there are three things. Okay, let me just talk briefly about appearance. Three things. Living faith will never be deeper life. Christ's embassy will never be celestial church. Look up. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? So let me announce once and for all on behalf of my glorious king and his government. Ladies in the... No, we will never reach a point where all the ladies in the world will stop wearing trousers. And we will never get to a point in the world where all the ladies in the world will wear trousers. Hello. I hope you like what I'm saying. We will never get to a point where guys will stop wearing jeans. And we will never get to the point where everybody in the whole world will wear suits. Listen, friends. The secret to the growth of the corporate body is to concentrate on our similarities, not the differences. Hallelujah. So should I say something at least about appearance? Alright. Very quickly. We'll look at just one scripture. I didn't want to touch it. You really want me to touch this? I will touch it if you can give me the popular scripture that says, let a woman not wear what belongs to a man. Who can give? Calm down. Deuteronomy what? Alright, let's go there and see what the word of God has to say. Deuteronomy what? Oh Lord, I pray. That your word will come with power. Set men free. Many believers are saved. Many are filled with the Holy Ghost. But very few are free. We hail you. Most the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. This was Moses giving... The law of brotherhood, as many translations put it. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Are you there? Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Mm. So that's the... That's the, that's the scripture that has brought all kinds of things. And um, 
we've had several people confused about all of this. I did a little study, shocking study. So follow me. We are going to examine just three words and then we will be out of that place. Hallelujah. The word pertaineth in the Hebrew is the word keli. K-E-L-I-Y. And this is what it means in the Hebrew. We are examining that scripture. There are several believers that take scriptures out of context. That's why as much as possible try to get a Bible concordance. Dex concordance. Or at least buy amplified. Many of us, you have one torn Bible that fire burned half of it. That's one you took in your pocket and put. How will you grow that way? When they open to the scripture, you start, you don't see the first part of the verse you are looking for because fire has burnt it. And then you cram only half of it. Then you use it to build doctrine. Now, the word pertaineth in the Hebrew, this is what it means. It means, number one, an article. It means a vessel. It means an implement or an utensil. Isn't that amazing? That's what the word pertaineth means. Hallelujah. Very important. Now, the word man that is used in Deuteronomy 5 is not the word Adam. Interesting. I hope you know Adam means man from the dust of the earth. It's not the word Adam. Is the word, I don't know how to pronounce it, I Y S H. You know what they call it? That thing you put, apostrophe, right? All right, I Y S H. And this is what it means. Listen, it means a soldier, it means a warrior, it means a man of war. Follow me. Are you listening to me? It means a warrior, a soldier, a man of war. Men that go for war. Now you understand the context because at this point Israel were always fighting. Hallelujah. Moses was giving something very, very powerful. And so, if this were to be arranged and put properly, this is what it would be in the Hebrew. The woman shall not put on the weapons or the armor of a warrior. Neither shall a warrior put on a woman's garment. For all that do it is an abomination unto the Lord. Women were not permitted to go for war. I hope you know that in Jewish custom. Women were not allowed. Relax. Women were not allowed to go for war. Listen, trust me, you are smiling. I'm soon coming back to the other side. I... Praise God. So Moses was admonishing the people, preparing them. It was an abomination according to the principles of the Jewish people. That's why women didn't go for war. Scriptural proof. That's why Bathsheba was back at home. Hallelujah. When the people went for war. And David violated the principle because kings followed the people to go for war. And he didn't go for the war. And so while he was meandering around his veranda, he saw the woman. Women were not. That's why till today, in certain nations of the world, women. It's just necessity that has made women to join military. Are you listening to me? It was not part of the Jewish custom. That's why the worst kind of warfare is that you kill men, women, and children. Women and children were exempted. It's believed that when you capture the men and when you fight. How many of you remember when Gideon was going to fight the Midianites? Hallelujah. The women and the children were made to go back. And then all the men, the men of God, were the ones who went and so on and so forth. So that's what he's talking about. He really wasn't talking about a man, Adam, as it were. He was saying it's an abomination to put on the robe of war, that when the men become so irresponsible to a point that the women have to wear an armorage and go for war, it is an abomination unto them. Hallelujah. And so these things were taken and then we began to use them to teach all kinds of things. And now that's where the concept of trouser chaining, the concept of this and 
that came in and several people have insulted the western world have had on many pulpits many africans and nigerians ungratefully insulting the western world let me tell you what our official dress is wearing rags animal skin so if we are going back that's where we are going our official dressing was not scared it was animal skin let me tell you the official jewish clothes were even scared jesus of nazareth your jesus of nazareth that you watch what was jesus wearing uh, hold on calm down listen as you are la- i told you i'm coming back because there are many of you that you're agreeing to what i'm saying it's not a an openness for truth it's just a way of endorsing your heart of rebellion we will still check it So many people have been misled. And I know many books that have been written. And many people have been said, if you wear trousers, you are going to hellfire. Others have been said, if you wear skirts, you are going to hellfire. You are going to this, you are going to that. And sincerely, look at me. I'm not, I'm not, um, if you know me, I'm not a whether trouser or no trouser person. That's just really not me. The issue that the Bible puts, the central message, is two Christian character backed up by modesty and decency. What the church should be addressing is modesty. Because in Jewish days, prostitutes didn't wear trousers. They didn't wear mini skirts. But what they wore was transparent. And there are many people who are like that. They say, Shay, you say, don't wear trousers. Okay, I will not wear trousers. But what they are wearing can kill. So have we solved the problem? Are you listening to me? We have not solved the problem. Of, of There are so many people who camouflage in religiosity, but their hearts are terribly far away from God. And there are many people. I know a, 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 a woman who um, for years had a big challenge with this thing. And they truly believe. There are many people today who believe that demons attack them because they make they, they did make up. I know that we have read all kinds of occultic books that they use human hair, level 666, six, six, level 777, level 12, 12, 12, and they have used uh, um, um, uh, human blood to make you and all of that. And many of you, even cream you don't use because you say in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 story, 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 this and that and that. Why are we religious? I have a question to you. Why do we allow religion to stop us from walking in the fullness of what God has called us? Whether you are wearing trousers or no trousers, if you come and you are indecent, it's our job to send you away and say, go and dress well. Hallelujah. The true Christian character should be that of modesty and decency. That whatever the Bible says, that let your eating meat not cause your brother to sin. If I'm going to deeper life today, I will be stupid to dress like this and go to deeper life. Because, for instance, the, based on the, the doctrines and the tenets, they already believe. Why don't you quietly confirm for the sake of the gospel? Are you listening to me? It's called spiritual maturity. If I'm going to talk among a company of elderly people, 50s and above, why should I? I there's, there's nothing wrong. It's not the issue of good or bad. It's about being in the best position to communicate the life of Christ. Are you getting blessed tonight? And so, dissolve that grouping thing. We are the committee of ladies that wear trousers. We are the committee of ladies who don't wear trousers. We are the holy ones. We are the not sanctified ones. And begin to address the issue of decency or indecency. You have clothes that are not decent. Pack them and take them away. And look like a true ambassador, one who represents the government of heaven. But for you to preach and say wearing trousers or no wearing trousers is going to be the solution is a vain pursuit. There are six billion people on earth with different kinds of mindsets. And can I tell you something? We are all going to heaven. So I wonder how we will behave in heaven when we are already hating one another because of this. Many people, if they have their way, they will tell Jesus Christ, create another supper. There is one big table. And all of us are going to sit down on that table. It's called the supper of the Lamb. So you better begin to love your brother right now. Because
because you may sit close to him at that supper. Why do we hate one another? Am I addressing something, please? There are several people, there are several of you sitting down today that you have been stopped. Um, they've stopped you from relating with other people on grounds of certainty. God, God brought roommates and friends that can change and transform your destiny. But because of faulty foundations, there are many people, you know, you hear a tape and a message that can bless you. But simply because you have a problem with a few things in that man's church or whatever. But you know this person loves God. Just pass now things you don't receive. There are many of you that you are suffering from sin. You are suffering from all kinds of habits. And the Holy Spirit just points you to a message that was preached by W.F. Kumui. I say, Kumui, forget I'm a new creation man. I'm a this. And forget about whatever excesses, whether they wear earrings or this. Can you not open your heart and say, Lord, speak to me. I desire change more than anything. When we get that hungry, then we start forgetting. There are several people going to church is simply exploring to know those who are obedient to the word or not obedient by the standards of their foundation. So the moment we come to church, we're already frowning at everybody. The person sitting next to you puts perfume and you're like, oh God, this can't be. Let me tell you something. Heaven is not for only you. Heaven is for all of God's children and you are only one. Hallelujah. Are you getting blessed tonight? Is this setting somebody free tonight? Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord is foundation. So let me leave that so that I can quickly go into something else. I hope that at another platform we'll discuss the issue of the doctrine of eternal salvation. I'm just touching the ones that matter. Two or three. The doctrine of eternal salvation. Once saved, always saved. True or false? See, everybody's afraid now. Say, ah, I better mind my business. So, what does the word of God have to say about the concept of salvation? Because we have two groups of people: those who come, Father, I mean, Jesus Christ, I, I give you my life, I give you my all, take my all, and all of that, and then we walk contrite, we love God, and all of these things. And then there are others who teach that the moment your name is written in the book of life, that's all. In fact, there are people that argue and say there's nothing called the book of life. There's nobody's name written in the book of life. How old are we that we are arguing with the world? How old are you on this earth? Hallelujah. And so let me teach you what the word of God has to say. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Look up. It is possible to lose your salvation. Say it after me. It is possible to lose your salvation. Hear me. Don't let anybody preach any. Let me show you something the Bible says. Help us, Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. Paul was admonishing the church. We we'll reconcile after the meeting, but this is very important. And you need to listen to it. Many of you have finished exams. So sit down and. Let's have your attention and let God bless you. Galatians chapter 1, verse 9. I like all of us to read it. Verse 9. One to read. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. Any of you say, Ah, my prophet received it from the Spirit. Turn with me. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. Scripture to address your man of God. Now please, I'm bringing this out in love. Are you listening to me? We're not trying to condemn people or say this. And No, 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 no. no. We're not. I used to believe a lot of these things until I opened up my heart for God to help me too. So. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. I like the word of God to speak for itself. That's why I'm saying open it. Are you ready? Verse 4. One to read. Preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit, 
which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now look up. The word bear with him doesn't mean to believe him. Because that's what a lot of people have been misleading. And so somebody comes on your pulpit and is misleading your members. And I say the Bible says, just bear with him. And it's confusing the people who say, just wait a little while. And it's confusing me. He says, say it. Once saved, always saved. There are people who believe that because it was your spirit that was saved. As a believer, when you go and fornicate, it's really your body that fornicates. Your spirit is still sanctified. And so you are going to, ah, it's what your body will call the wrong. That's a lie. It doesn't make sense. So we have several believers who are living in all kinds and I tell you the truth, including ministers. I say it without any fear of evil. Men and women who have not kept the righteous precepts of God. Doing all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. And we justify all the things we are doing. But if we are that generation that will usher in the King, then there is need to check out. Because right now I was I was um, chatting with Alex. Many of you know Alex Jerry, and he was telling me the perversion that happens in America. In America right now, there's a show they do where the pastors are allowed to dance with some of the beautiful members. I mean, if you are not beautiful, just count yourself out of that list. They call it something. Yes, dance with the dance with the pastor. So you come just boogie with the pastor, and then when you dance. Is, is meant to foster social, cultural unity. Culturally correct, scripturally incorrect. Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord stands. I believe in prosperity. I believe in divine health. I also believe in holiness. Because see, there are many believers who have got it all wrong. When you just like say, what, what does this church or ministry you say, ah, you, can, you can do anything. What do you tell us? Flex in your ah, this is the wrong place. Here we, we iron people out. Not out of religion. Are you listening to me? Not out of religion. But at the same time, we have a responsibility under God to bring ourselves to a point where we are relevant in this society. Otherwise, let me tell you something. If we don't sharpen ourselves like this, our generation will miss it. In America right now, there's, there's all kinds of perversion. Marriage in America right now is the union of two adults. Anything. Well adult and a woman adult. Fine. But the Bible says, Therefore shall a man, Adam, a man, leave his father and mother and not cleave to another man. Cleave to not fish, not uh, whale. Not not vulture, not bed, not your nice sweet German shepherd. Cleave to his wife and they too, only they two are permitted to be one flesh. A man and a woman cannot be one flesh. You can be business partners, yes. You can be co ministers, co laborers in the vineyard, yes, but not one flesh in terms of unity. Hallelujah. So it's interesting that your relationship be with the opposite sex if you are serious about marriage. Say amen. If you are considering marriage, make sure the person you are considering is not the same as you. Otherwise, something is wrong. Who, who in the world would have believed that the church would need to address this? Hello, Kim Madonna. Hello, Gim Madonna. Hello, Gim. Hello, Gim Madonna. Hello, Gim Madonna. Hello, Gim. Hello, Gim. But hear me, 
I've done something here. Give me. Hallelujah. While it is true that it's possible to lose your salvation, what many religious people put as a condition is wrong. That's the balance. We have established the fact that it's possible to lose your salvation. I beg you, friends, don't let anybody deceive you. Not in the name of any teaching. By the grace of God, we are committed to teaching you the uncompromising word of truth. And everything you hear us teach in this place are things that we have taken out time to seek the face of God and seek knowledge from other members of the body. Hallelujah. It is possible to lose your salvation. But what is the condition? So right. Because a lot of people have put religiosity. And so, when a believer, for instance, falls into the sin of fornication, or falls into a robbery or something, a lot of people look at him and say, you have missed out. There are many churches that call the person officially and say, like Paul, let's hand this over to the devil. Look at me, please. Look at me. Once and for all, let me clear this. Paul did not die for your sins. Everybody, please look at me. Paul is not Alpha and Omega. There are many places that Paul himself confesses inadequacy. Jesus Christ is perfect theology. The Bible says, looking up to Jesus. That he is the one who is the author. Are you listening to me? So, Jesus Christ is the perfection of all that we should be. We call him perfect theology. There are many of us, there are many people who followed all kinds of people, followed God's generals, followed all of this. I'm not saying there's, there's a place for mentorship and receiving from people and all of that and trusting the teachings you get. Are you listening to me? But I'm saying not above Christ. Paul himself needed to give his life to Christ. Any other person that wants to lead you to the Father outside of Jesus Christ will only mislead you. I repeat, any other person who wants to lead you to Christ aside from Jesus himself will mislead you. So what are the conditions? Two conditions. Number one. Two conditions to lose your salvation. Rebellion. Number two. Idolatry. These are the two biblical conditions. I'm sorry I don't have time. I have to rush. These are the two biblical conditions that can cause a man to lose his salvation. Let me tell you what rebellion is. Look up. Rebellion is a willful, perpetual, and continuous um, violation of God's laws and principles. A willful, perpetual, continuous violation of God's principles in spite of the convictions of the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to me? Rebellion is not that I have a habit I'm struggling with and God is helping me. You know, it's, it's something I feel for instance. Let's assume in, let's assume cameraman, let's assume hallelujah. Let's assume I have a problem sleeping around for instance. Alright? Then I'm sleeping around and doing every kind of thing. And I'm still a preacher. I listen to me. And every time I'm convicted in my spirit. And it's an issue. It's, it's an issue. I cry about it. That's not rebellion. Are you listening to me? That's a wrong habit. That needs the power of God. That's why we take our time to fix miracle services. Where people come and the strongholds are broken. That's why we keep feeding you with God's word. But rebellion is when it becomes a a state of iniquity in my heart such that I'm not even repentant about it again. For instance, like I've planned that after preaching, for instance, for instance, that after preaching like this, then ah, today is Friday, I'll go and cool off somewhere. After, after, after all the, I mean, all the stress of shouting and the rest, I go and have a nice weekend with a lady. I mean, I'm preaching. But it's, it's in my heart. I have planned it. I have purposed it. I know I'll do it in two weeks' time. I know I'll do it again. Another thing. Um, stealing. All of these things. These are acts of iniquity and rebellion. You steal.
steal your roommate's um, money and then when you steal the money you laugh about it and you are waiting for another opportunity to do it there's no the difference between rebellion and just having a challenge that god is helping you is that there is still the conviction of the holy spirit and that you are yielding to that conviction are you listening to me so that satan doesn't tell you look you are always doing this you are going to hellfire while you know that in your heart is a challenge you are struggling Paul himself had a struggle and is in heaven today. He said, the things that I want to do, I do not find myself doing them. But the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. He said, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? It is for such that in Christ there is no condemnation. But when a man comes to a state of iniquity, iniquity, where it becomes an issue, let's assume that, for instance, I consult, let's assume all the power and the manifestation that are happening in this place is some um, babalao agreement that is done somewhere. I will not be surprised if there are people who believe that that's what we use in this place. The guy and a young man be having, how can young people be having word of knowledge, prophecies, man? There's something. <laughs> oh, yes, it's true that there's something, but it's the power of the Lord Jesus. That's why we give him all the glory. Hallelujah. Very quickly, let's go. So, rebellion. And then number two, idolatry. Idolatry. Hear me, friends. Idolatry will take any man to hell. Idolatry is putting in the position of Jesus Christ. Anything, an idol, an object that is not him. There are many families who are half Christian, half traditional idolatry. When the situation gets bad, they run to one small, uh, one small goddess with mirror and broom, just lying somewhere in a secret room that only some of our fathers enter. Many ministers in this country who consult this idol and come out in the power of the idol begin to minister with power and in quote signs and wonders. Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standeth short. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are sins. And let every man that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Hallelujah. I'll stop here for now those issues the last thing I'll do before we pray is I want to read out to you from the word of God what every believer should have call your Christian statement of faith your creed a summary of what Jesus Christ left with the church are you listening to me I don't care what church you belong hear me and by the way, let me say this. I, I hope you know that, of course, this is the body of Christ, but this is not a church, an assembly as it were. This is an apostolic meeting where God is changing people. That's why we don't care what church you are coming from. You are always welcome. Hallelujah. Catholic, Anglican, Celestial, um, Guru Maharaj, um, anyone, you are welcome. We welcome you in the name of Jesus so long as you are open to hear the truth. And what I'm about to tell you now is not the doctrine of any church or any ministry. It's the truth of God's word. The foundation of God is built upon this. Are you ready to listen? Number one. The Bible is the inspired word of God. No matter what church, what doctrine, what denomination, what sect, if you truly name the name of Christ, then let's begin to straighten out something. I've, I've spoken about a few faulty foundations. There's no need going into them. Um, my job is not to show the things that are wrong, but to put in structure the things that are right. So the Bible is the inspired word of God. A revelation from God to mankind. And hear me, the Bible has supreme
supreme authority over all matters of faith and conduct. If you are a Christian that is in the family of God, then this is one tenant you must put. I'm telling you the teaching, the foundations of the Lord. The Bible has the supreme authority. That means the end of all arguments is the Bible, the Word of God. The Bible stands supreme to the doctrine of any man, denomination, generation, including Joshua Selma. The Bible is superior to ENI, superior to Koinonia, superior to your church, superior to your pastor, superior to me, superior to every apostle, every prophet, superior to God's generals, superior to Paul, Philip, Nathaniel, I don't care, superior to anybody. The Bible, the infallible, irrefutable word of God. These are the foundations. Second Timothy, if you want a scripture on that, Second Timothy three, verse fifteen to sixteen, and then First Peter chapter two, verse two, very quickly, so that we can pray briefly. We're out of time. Number two, that there is one true God. There is one true God who has revealed Himself in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look up. Say after me, the Father. Say it, the Father, the Son, and the third one is not you. The third one is the Holy Spirit. Say after me, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Coexisting in unity. It's a mystery we do not fully understand, but we are sure of. That's why it's called faith. Are you listening to me? So I've had all kinds of teachings trying to explain the Trinity. There is only so much that the Word of God has to tell us about this. And we believe. Faith is that you believe even when you do not see. And we know. I know it's true. I know it's true. Hallelujah. There are two places in the Scripture that reveal that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is there. For instance, in the encounter of Philip when he was about being stoned, the Bible says Philip was full of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was living in him. Hallelujah. And the Bible says he looked up to heaven and saw the Father seated and Jesus standing at his right hand. So we see the Trinity. Hallelujah. And then in the baptism of Jesus, we see that Jesus, the Son, the Word, who had become flesh, was standing and the Holy Spirit coming and a voice speaking from heaven. Hallelujah. So there's no point doubting the existence of the Trinity. Number three. Salvation. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Look up. Christ is the only begotten. Okay, no, no, no. Listen, look up. Christ is now not the only begotten Son. Christ was the only begotten Son when He walked upon the earth. Right now, He's the firstborn among we, the brethren. So correct that in your statement of faith. Christ is not the only begotten Son of the Father. Otherwise you would say God has lied in the world. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called. As many as received Him, He gave them power to be called. So we are joint heirs with Him. Partakers of His divine nature. Hallelujah. God incarnate called Jesus Christ. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Listen. The foundation on which the Christian faith is built. Born of the Virgin Mary. Born of the Virgin Mary. It's important to know that the word of God, Da Vinci Code notwithstanding, cast all those nonsense out of your house. Fully God. And he was fully man. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of the Father. Taking upon himself the demands and the necessities of human nature and identifying himself completely with mankind but without sin. It's important to believe that Jesus died. It's important to believe that he died on a cross. A train didn't kill him. He died on a cross. That's what the Bible says. 
you we are, we are examining our foundation. He died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb, a virgin tomb, belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. Hallelujah. And on the third day, he rose again. He rose again. You must believe that Jesus Christ rose again. There are many believers that have not really taken our time to find out whether they believe or not. You must believe. And that Jesus Christ is today seated at the right hand of the Father. The right hand of authority. According to scriptures, making intercession for the saints. And the Bible says that we are seated with Him. Very, very important. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He enables us to understand the truth. He draws sinners to God and convicts them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He calls them to Jesus Christ. He effects the new birth. And the Holy Spirit dwells in all born again believers. If you are truly born again in Christ, whether you feel it or not, the Holy Spirit lives in you. He bestows the spiritual gifts. By which the person can serve God. He's the one who cultivates true Christian character. He comforts believers. His presence in the life of the Christian serves to bring the believer into the fullness of the statue of Christ. The Holy Spirit assures us of salvation. He enlightens our minds and empowers the believer in worship, in evangelism, in service. Hallelujah important. I'm reading some of these things so that our, our hearts be founded properly. That it is by grace that men are saved through faith. It is not of works. That's what the Bible says. The grace of God brings salvation through the preaching of the repentance of the word of God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me. It is only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that brings people to salvation. One more time I repeat. It is only through faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work that men are saved. Hallelujah. There are two doctrines that Jesus Christ left with the church. The doctrine of the water baptism and the doctrine of the communion. Both are supposed to be doctrines that reinforce and bring us into the understanding of our unity, identifying with Him in death and being alive. The ordinance of baptism by a burial with Christ should be observed. Now it's important. It's a doctrine that Christ left with the church. The doctrine of water baptism. So it's a healthy one. It's encouraged. But it's not the condition to go to heaven. There is nowhere in scripture that says your going to salvation is tied to whether you are baptized in water or not. However, it is important we observe it because it's a doctrine and an ordinance that Jesus left with the church. And so part of our compliance as being obedient citizens of the, of, of the kingdom is to observe it. However, we have records of people like the man on the cross who are not baptized. But Jesus said, this day you will be with me. Hallelujah. And we have records of many babies who died and are in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. It's a symbolism of our identification with Jesus in death and that we are alive with Him today. The Lord's Supper consists of bread and any fruit of the vine. It's a symbol of expression and sharing of our divine nature with Christ. A memorial of His suffering and death. And we are encouraged to observe this until He comes. The baptism of believers is the unique work of the Holy Ghost. And evidence of which is the speaking of other tongues. Oh, brothers and sisters, believe this. Please believe this. It has nothing to do with Pentecostalism. As the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. The scriptures teach a life of holiness. Without which no man will see the Lord. By the power of the Holy Ghost. We are able to obey that command that we should be holy for His holy. 
Entire sanctification is the will of God for all believers and should be earnestly pursued by walking in obedience to God's word. Not the religious practice that people are doing. Another foundational truth. The church is the body of Christ. Look at me. Not your church. The church. Are you hearing me? Your church is only, they are only members of that universal body. Because there are many ministries that behave as if they are the only ones who represent the church. We are not giving that kind of devilish ministry. The church, the word ecclesia, is the word that is translated in English, Catholic. The universal church, the bride of Christ. One man is not sufficient to be the bride of Christ. The church in our fullness and our unity we represent the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. The church is the body of Christ. The habitation of God through the Spirit with divine appointments for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And hear me, every believer born of the Spirit is an integral part of the church. Of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Sorry, there's no time to give you all of the scriptures. Any divinely ordained ministry, look at me, any ministry, apostolic, prophetic, any assembly, any church, any denomination, hear me, is provided for a twofold purpose. Number one, world evangelization. And number two, the equipping and the edification of the body. So any ministry, I don't care what the name of the ministry is. That is not committed to the ministry of soul winning and the building and the edification of the body. With whatever kind of revelation, prosperity, divine health, miracles, holiness, faith, any ministry that claims to be called of God and is not directly involved in soul winning and the building and edification of the church needs to go back and check that position. We're rounding up. That deliverance from sickness is provided for in the atonement and is the privilege of all believers. We have made it look as if this is a Pentecostal reality. It's part of the realities of the death of Christ. By whose stripes he was healed. Healing and deliverance is part of the blessing of redemption. Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 4 11 to 13. Then the resurrection. Hear me. There is something called rapture. Ha. And there is something called the resurrection of the dead. Are you listening to me? I don't care what message you have been preached. Let no man deceive you. There is something called the resurrection of the dead. And a day will come when believers will exit this earth. A day will come. And guess what? It's coming very, very soon. Whether you believe it or not, will not stop it. Everybody in hellfire today is a believer. The only issue is that they believe too late. So, whether you want to believe it or not, there is a place called heaven. A real place called heaven. There is another place called hell. Both of them are real places. There is yet another place called the lake of fire. And hear me. In hell today, there are people who left this morning. Relocated from this morning. They woke up with you but right now. And guess what? They can hear what we are preaching. Oh yes, it is given unto them. Because the rich man in hell said, oh, let's send Lazarus to go and preach to my brothers so that they will not come here. And he said they have Moses and the prophets. Moses represents the law because that was the dispensation of the law. They have the law and the prophets. If they will not listen, even if he comes, they will not listen. But God has granted our generation. There are several people that have come back from the dead. I've gone to heaven and I've gone to hell shouting that there is a place called heaven and hell. And many of us have allowed our westernization to cheat us. There is a real place. 
after me, there is a place called heaven. And there is a place called hell. Thank you, Jesus. The resurrection of those who are falling asleep in Christ and their translation, together with those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, is imminent and is the blessed hope of the church. The devil and his angels, the beast and the false prophet, and whoever is not found in the book of life shall be consigned to everlasting punishment in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is what the Bible calls the second death. Revelation 19 verse 20, Revelation 20 verse 10 to 15. Soon we are going to take a series on the end times. In theology, we call it eschatology. There is a promise of a new heaven and a new earth when all of this church age is wrapped. Second Peter three thirteen and Revelation twenty one verse one. There are many more, but these brothers and sisters, for time's sake, encapsulate the foundation of the Lord, the basis on which every believer's faith must be built upon. Whether you wear trousers or you don't wear trousers, whether your hair is veiled or not veiled, whether you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues, whether you believe in miracles or you don't believe in miracles, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died and resurrected, you are not a member of God's family. And guess what? There is only one place in hell for Emmanuel, all the world is calling your name. Emmanuel, when you come again. Emmanuel, and the church will be your holy face. Emmanuel, when Sing it one more time, then we'll pray. Emmanuel, all the world is calling your name. Emmanuel, when you come again. Emmanuel, and the church will be your holy place. Emmanuel. Prosperity, believe in holiness, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, believe in the grace of God and in His mercy, believe in His power to keep you, believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, believe in praying in tongues, believe in the edification of the Spirit, believe in the salvation of souls. Believe in faith. Let your foundation be strong. Believe that it takes more than prophetic accuracy for you to know that a man is truly of God. Believe that the gifts of the Spirit is not necessarily equal to spiritual maturity. Believe that you are a partaker of His divine nature. Believe that there is no condemnation for you. That no man can condemn you. The Holy Spirit convicts men, but he does not condemn. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Maybe there was yesterday, but there is therefore now. And the Bible says the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Bringing the church into an understanding of so that we are not taught here and there by every wind of doctrine. Believe that the word of God is above every prophetic revelation. It's above every spiritual encounter. That even if you have a dream and you claim you saw Jesus Christ, if what he told you and how he led you is not consistent with the word, what you saw was not Jesus Christ. Believe in the immutable 
encounter of God. Hate poverty, believe in prosperity as the package and the blessings of God. Run away from the religiosity of the Lord. Try to be right by your own strength. Try to be holy by your strength. None of these things will help. There are many who have been struggling because they are trying to live by their strength. The Bible says, Oh, by the arm of flesh and woman.
you are a businessman, realize that you are a minister. If you are a caterer, realize that you are a minister. If you are a student, realize that you are a minister. If you are a husband, a wife, a preacher, we are all in ministry. What is the ministry? To do and to teach our job in Christ. You must believe that the day will come. There will no longer be bishop, later, sickness, poverty. Together we will rule and reign with you. This is what the Bible calls the foundation of the Lord. Right on the
if I speak with tongues of men and of angels and I have no love, I am nothing. He said, if I know all these things and all of these things and I have no love, there are so many believers that live without love. When you hear that a member of a ministry or a member of a church or denomination falls, we rejoice. What a shame to the church. And tonight, we are praying and say, Lord, let the walking of the Lord come out of me. That the joy of the member of the body will be the joy of everybody. That the soul of the member will bring everybody to live together. When the love of God is at work in our life, when we get down out of this world, we will see the greatness of life. Go ahead and pray for your friends. to our youtube channel to listen to apostle joshua selman's messages apostle arome osai's messages archbishop benson dahosa and apostle should be thank you very much enjoy <laughs> 